Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Robert Piazantine. I'm currently the chair of the Alzheimer's Society of BC's Board of Directors. I want to offer a very heartfelt and warm welcome to all of you to this, our special virtual legislature, legislature luncheon for World Alzheimer's Day. The theme of our luncheon this year is the important timely theme of resilience. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the Alzheimer's Society of BC operates on traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Indigenous peoples around the province. Our provincial office is located on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil with regional resource centres located on traditional territories in all regions of BC. Our vision for a dementia-friendly province, where people living with dementia and their caregivers are welcomed, included, and supported, will only be possible by ensuring that everyone living on these territories has access to support that is culturally safe, barrier-free, and free from Indigenous specific or any type of racism. The Legislature Luncheon is an important event for the Society each year. And as I finish my term as the Society's Board Chair, I'm extremely excited that we are able to connect virtually like this today, even if we can't yet be together in the Hall of Honor at the BC Legislature Building in Victoria. Um, it's brilliant to see so many people joining us here today online. Um, we hope that you'll all be able to take some time to tweet about the event using the hashtag World Alzheimer's Day. I'd encourage you to take a selfie with the Forget Me Not pin. Hopefully you all have it. Hopefully you can see mine. Um, that was sent to your constituency offices and show your support. You can also use the chat box to share your thoughts or just let us know that you're here. We have um, Avery monitoring the chat today. And if you run into any technical challenges, Dave from McMedia Productions is available if you wanna send him a direct message over the chat. I'm now honored to hand things over to our co-host for today, the Honorable Adrian Dix, BC's Minister of Health. There you go, let me be the first with trouble in meeting myself. Uh, thank you, Robert. And I just wanna, on behalf of Really all my colleagues in the legislature, thank you for all your work as, as board chair of the Alzheimer's Society. I know that there's always, uh, these are always times of transition uh, uh, and I know you have an outstanding board chair incoming, but uh, you've done amazing work. Uh, your personal commitment to this, your family commitment to this, your commitment to the society and the hours and hours you put in are so, so appreciated by every member of the legislature, so thank you. I'm in uh, downtown Vancouver today on the territory of the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh. I wanted to introduce some of the people who are here, including three of my colleagues in the legislature who will be speaking uh, in a little bit in answers to questions. And uh, all three of them are fierce supporters of the Alzheimer's Society and of seniors in BC. Uh, the first of my is the Parliamentary Secretary for Senior and Long-Term Care, Mabel Elmore. Second is the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Shirley Bond, and uh, who's also the Opposition Health Critic and, uh, and uh, you know, is a very, very strong supporter of the Society, both in Prince George and everywhere. And my colleague, the Leader of the, the BC Green Party, Sonia Firstino, uh, from Vancouver Island, from Calkin, who's also a very strong supporter of the Society, and you'll hear from all of them later. And I know they represent that this, uh, at this virtual luncheon, all of our colleagues from all the different parties in the legislature who are united, I think, in the goal today to express our support, our appreciation, our common commitment to people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias in DC and to spring them and their families. And so I get to do something really privileged today. I want to also note, we're also joined by Craig Burns, who's going to, you're going to be hearing from, who's a member of the BC leadership group of people living with dementia. Uh, and uh, Amy McCallion, who is the incoming board chair, and I really made your job tougher by, by pumping up Robert's role there, uh, Amy, but I know you're going to do a great job, and it'll be great to have you there. And everyone at the Society, I'm going to be introducing Jen Lyle, the CEO of the Alzheimer's Society, in a, in a moment, but great to see you, Jen, and great to see all of the people there, 111 participants. I'm getting better at understanding what's in front of me here. The 111 participants on the line who reflect both the support for the society, but I think, and you see this every time we have an in-person event sponsored by the Alzheimer's Society in BC. And when the majority of members of all caucuses on quite busy days for us come, that commitment, that collective commitment of all members and all parties is there. And I get to announce something today. And so I'm going to announce something today, which is, um, 
hopefully not a surprise. I don't think it's a surprise, but it reflects the commitment of all of my colleagues in the legislature. I'm proud to announce that the government of BC is providing 5.4 million in funding to support the first of the work of First Link and the Alzheimer's Society of BC for the next two years. This funding, along with the critical funds raised by donors and community members, will allow the society to increase its reach by strengthening relationships with healthcare providers, growing cultural specific su supports and expanding both virtual programming and support calls. Everybody knows what a great program First Link is that more than 13,500 13, British Columbians are connected and relying on First Link. And your work makes a difference in every single one of the, those people. And it makes a difference at a crucial moment in the lives of people and their families. That moment sometimes of fear, of anxiety, of incomprehension, of the impact of dementia, when people are reaching out to help, for help, to help people who know who understand and who support them in those times, who can provide their own witness to what they're all going through. And everybody is going through something in those circumstances. And there can be a lot of joy, but only a lot of challenge. And we all know this. First Link does a great job in doing that. Receiving that diagnosis of dementia is a day that uh, is, a, is an unbelievably difficult day for everyone. The support and kindness, which is, I think, central to what the Alzheimer's Society does is something uh, that is demonstrated through First Link. We're proud to support it with this 5.4 million over the next two years. It reflects, I believe, as I said, the active support of every member of the legislature. And I'm proud to have the right on their behalf to let people know about it today. So thank you. And over to you, Jen Lyle, say a few words. The CEO, CEO of the Alzheimer's Society. Thank you so much, Minister Dix. The Alzheimer's Society of BC is so grateful of the significant support for First Link that we've received from the province of BC as part of our partnership, allowing us to offer programs and services to people affected by the disease. Welcome everyone and thank you for being here today. We appreciate you taking the time to show your commitment to the thousands of British Columbians who are affected by Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. We are joined today by members of BC's Legislative Assembly, staff and volunteers from the Alzheimer's Society of BC and special guests and supporters from throughout the province. While we can't be together in person, the reality of virtual events is that we can invite even more people into the conversation. Our vision is a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and that world begins with a more dementia-friendly province where people affected by dementia are acknowledged, supported and included. To make our vision a reality, we focused on changing the conversation about dementia, changing the experience of the disease by ensuring people can connect to First Link dementia support, changing the practice of working with and caring for people affected by dementia through education for healthcare providers, changing the policy related to dementia and ensuring the voices of people with lived experience inform that policy and changing the future through the support of research. It's been a very difficult time for everyone, but particularly for people affected by dementia, who've been disproportionately affected by challenges like isolation, highlighting the necessity for human connection and the right to be heard and have needs addressed. I have been inspired by the tremendous tenacity and resilience shown as we navigate through a changing landscape, adapting to virtual events like this one today because it isn't possible to be with people in person. This speaks to the fact that people living with dementia can continue to do the things they love and remain active in their communities with the right help and support. Key to building a dementia-friendly province is listening to people affected by the disease and amplifying their voices. By calling attention to the stories of people with lived experience, we can change the conversation about the disease. Today, I'm pleased to introduce a special speaker, Craig Burns. Craig is someone who's experienced the dementia journey both as a caregiver, his mother lived with dementia, and then later as a person living with the disease himself. Since his diagnosis, Craig has been an active society member. He's a member of the society's board of directors and our BC leadership group of people living with dementia. I'd like to invite Craig to share the challenges he's experienced living with dementia during the pandemic. Good afternoon. 
it's very good to be with each of you today. To say the last year and a half has been challenging is an understatement. I'm sure we would all agree. I have certainly experienced many unusual circumstances, conversations, feelings, and realities. I've needed to be resourceful, creative, and move ahead in spite of the challenges. I'm thankful I've been able to keep in touch with my family, my friends, and my colleagues. I have at least one new skill, the ability to Zoom. Zoom is now my friend. I could have chosen with all the restrictions to stay in my home all the time, shut down emotionally, terminate the use of technology, and sink into despair. And there were moments. After all, I have Alzheimer's dementia. I'm probably allowed or expected to call it quits and pack it in. I was diagnosed in 2016 after years of experiencing memory problems and seeking answers as to what was happening to my brain. My workplace setting had been in not-for-profit management, a very rewarding and fulfilling career. That ended in 2016. No, I haven't packed it in or told everyone to go away or said I'm done. I've discovered my ability to adapt, to make changes and to move forward while living well with dementia. The disease is progressing. My memory is deteriorating. My, my abilities are diminishing. Those are the realities. I've lived in Kelowna for 30 years. Over the past year and a half, I have continued to keep active, both physically and mentally. I work out and exercise at a local gym three times a week. I monitor my diet. I walk every day up to 10 kilometers some days. Even with the pandemic with safety protocols in place, I find enjoyment in socializing with people on my walks. I stayed in contact with the Alzheimer's Society of BC throughout the pandemic, receiving regular uh, calls, checking in on how I was doing. In the midst of all the changes in over the two years, I've been on a wait list for a new home setting, an independent living residence. A suite became available for May 31st. Hmm, what to do? Go for it or wait for a better time? I opted to go for it. My condo sold in five days. Packing, getting rid of things, worrying, anxiety, stress. But I do seek to be proactive for myself and my family to make decisions before they're forced upon me. My new two bedroom suite is within a complex that includes independent living, assisted living, and long-term care, both which I will be able to access when needed. Services will be available when I need them. That's important to me in my planning and I have the support of my family. Yes, I'm tired. Am I stressed? A lot of the time. Do I experience anxiety? Yes, on a daily basis. Resilient? Yes, I'm, I'm moving forward with my life. I continue with my volunteer involvements. They, they focus on three areas, research, education, and elder law. In research, I participate in uh, a UBC Vancouver uh, research project to address discrimination and stigma of dementia, seeking to change the landscape. As well, I continue to be a volunteer patient in a clinical drug trial, and that's five years going now, a lot of work. Education, uh, I'm a volunteer patient for UBC Okanagan Medical School. I also support the Alzheimer's Society of BC in various ways, whether it's public speaking or serving on their governing board, and then always new opportunities that come my way. In elder law, I'm a member of an advisory council for the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, focusing on improving the lives of older adults in their relationship to the law, to educate, to inform, to provide counsel for their decision-making in legal matters, for they to make their decisions on what will happen with their lives. Am I at peace with my dementia? No, not really. Do I have fear? Yes, I'm losing my abilities. I'm becoming more dependent on others. Am I contributing? Yes. I'm very thankful that I can utilize my skills, my knowledge, and my know-how to assist others personally and in formal settings. What does resiliency look like to me? 
I thrive on and enjoy music. When it's one of my joys. It, it calms my spirit. I foster and I deepen my relationships, my volunteer involvements, projects, and the people who I'm, whom I volunteer with. They're the important people in my life, like my family, my adult children, their spouses, and my six grandchildren. Also the residents in my new home setting. I'm getting to know them. It's, it's, it's very good. Resilience for me is discovered in my ability and my willingness to adapt to changing circumstances and health realities. Yes, I, I, I get discouraged. I, I get disheartened, disappointed. However, I also gain so much more by giving out and participating in life and using the old but the relevant catchphrase, make, just making a difference. Thank you so much for the opportunity to inform and to encourage each of you today. And now we'll be showing a short video from the BC leadership groups. A dementia friendly province to me means uh, living in a community, in a province that doesn't have the stigma against dementia. I think for me that uh, a dementia friendly province would mean that I would never have to again say, well, dementia is, and go on with an explanation. Um, a province that is functioning without stigma and where caregivers and people living with dementia get the supports they need to live their lives with dignity. A dementia friendly province would mean a province of inclusion for all people, regardless of disabilities, ethnicities, or any other stigmas that we tend to put on people that are different. It has um, had an impact on, on my socialization and my ability to feel confident when uh, out for a walk or um, uh, transiting the, the community. There aren't a lot of services already in place for caregivers and people living with dementia. And during the pandemic, most of them disappeared. There were a couple of organizations um, that ramped up the services, but a lot of what we rely on completely disappeared. That was challenging. COVID has impacted the mental health unquestionably of, uh, of people, not only in this province, but worldwide. And I think long-term folks in long-term care have been um, some of the hardest hit um, mentally and socially by COVID. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the biggest personal challenge I faced is an outbreak being declared at my mother's long-term care home. The restrictions, uh, yes, but they're needed, but they are the most challenging. Uh, and so what does that mean? What are the alternative ways of interacting that, that could be put in place or might have been thought about ahead of time to increase our ability to interact without being face to face? I think um, where I hope that we can all get to is I miss hugs. I miss the fact that um, even today being fully vaccinated, uh, everyone's a little cautious. And what I look forward to is being able to travel. I love to travel internationally. My friends love to travel and we've been missing that. So that, that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, I look at a long-term care situation that hasn't been tinkered with, hasn't been played around with, but has been overhauled because that's what's required in many fronts. What I'm most looking forward to when things finally open up is spending the Christmas holidays with my mom. I think it's important to have the voice of the person with dementia at the table because we are the ones that know how we feel, what we need, and um, what will make things better in the future. Um, we really need to engage people who are directly affected by it. So talk to the families, talk to the people who are directly affected. And uh, I think it will be important going forward to um, continue uh, 
ensuring dementia is uppermost in people's minds and policy in the minds of policymakers. I do wish to be involved in the development of policies that promote understanding, the honoring of our differences, and offering solutions to tangible problems. Thank you to the um, members of the leadership groups for providing their great perspectives on, on living with dementia and how it's impacted throughout this whole last pandemic stretch. We now would like to hear from representatives from each of the parties. Um, we're very lucky today to be joined by Parliamentary Secretary for Senior Services and Long-Term Care, Mabel Elmore, Interim Leader of the BC Liberal Party and Critic for Senior Services and Long-Term Care, Shirley Bond, and the Leader of the BC Green Party, Sonia Furstenau, who will each be answering some questions from our BC leadership groups for people living with dementia. To start off, I would like to pass the virtual mic to Patrick Tam, who is a caregiver. Patrick? Um, thanks, Robert. I've been caring for my dad, Michael, um, who's been living with dementia since 2010. Um, Dad's still at home, um, being cared for by my mom, who's an 82 year old. So uh, lots of concerns there from a family's perspective. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today to recognize World Alzheimer's Day. My question to the panel is, how has your experience with dementia inform your thoughts about building a dementia-friendly British Columbia? Thank you, Patrick. Perhaps we can hear from Parliamentary Secretary Elmore first. Terrific. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Patrick, uh, for sharing your experience and your question. Um, and I think I, I join you and everyone uh, joining our your the Alzheimer event today. Um, you know, share the goal of seeing British Columbia as a, a dementia friendly province. Um, I share that. And what comes to mind for me, Patrick, is a real need to ensure that we're practicing, um, you know, uh, best practices here in British Columbia. Uh, we participate uh, in the national um, dementia strategy, which the federal government has um, enacted, uh, a dementia strategy for Canada. Um, together we aspire and there's some key principles uh, in that that we also practice in British Columbia that comes to mind and we've heard it from a number of the folks who shared their experiences in the in the uh, video that we watched a person centered uh, approach to care focus on preventing uh, dementia advancing therapies um, with the initiative as well to find a cure um, and improving quality of life for people living with uh, dementia and caregivers. Um, and certainly a key compo component and theme uh, that I am hearing is this ongoing effort uh, to really, um, uh, really uh, get rid of the stigma around a dementia. And part of that is uh, raising awareness. Uh, part of it is ensuring that there's adequate supports in place uh, for caregivers and really uh, educating, I think, the public, providing that support. And I, I'll close, because uh, I know um, I'm looking forward to hearing to my other colleague, is that the active participation is, is, um, is so key uh, from folks living with Alzheimer's and caregivers. So thank you very much. Thank you for that very thoughtful answer. It was brilliant. Um, over to Emily Bond. Well, uh, good afternoon. And, and first of all, uh, I, I come to you today and I'm very appreciative to be on the traditional territory of the Clayton Tanay First Nation. So honored to work with them in, in, in so many ways. And I, I do want to uh, recognize the Alzheimer's Society of BC for the incredible work they do. And thank you, Minister Dix, for your support and announcement today uh, of First uh, Link funding. That's important to all of us on this screen and everyone who sits in the legislature. When you ask Patrick about my experience and what shapes my thinking about dementia, um, my father had dementia. And I can tell you that um, one of the things that, that I, I drives me uh, to, to work with Minister Dix and to other members of the Legislative Assembly is uh, the, the feeling that we had as a family. We learned that it's a family disease. It's, it, is, uh, it, is, it impacts everyone in that family. And I remember one of the things that, that was so hard, my, my father experienced um, a degree of, de uh, of aggression uh, as his uh, dementia progressed. And I remember feeling like I had to explain to people that that's not the dad that I knew. 
And it was this sense of this person that I adored uh, had changed and uh, I needed to come to grips with that. And I think what I want is a province and a community where people, when they know someone has dementia, there isn't a need to explain uh, about the person that still exists and that we care for and love and cherish so very much. So I'm um, very driven by my own personal experience uh, from a, a loving, caring, wonderful father uh, who, who certainly changed in the latter part of his uh, life. But um, we loved him nonetheless, and we wanted to share his story and have people understand his circumstances and those that our, our family was facing. Thank you, Emily Bond. Um, finally, I'd like to ask Emily first to know for your thoughts. So thank you so much. And, and uh, I am here at the legislature on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and delighted to join once again uh, for the luncheon. Can't wait till we can do this in person. And, and Patrick, I'm with you. The hugging will be nice. Um, and thank you to Alzheimer's Society and Robert for your work as board chair. And I, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues and the health minister that we are united across party lines in our support for the work of the Alzheimer's Society and working for people uh, with dementia and, and for people who are supporting them. Uh, a particular thank you to Craig for sharing your story and I think really hitting home the importance of destigmatizing dementia and really redoubling our efforts to make our province more dementia friendly. I'm, I'm grateful and heartened to hear your story about the support that you have. You are resilient and also inspiring and I'm grateful for that. The measure of our collective success as a society really lies in how do we care for the most vulnerable, whether that's our seniors or our children, people living with disabilities, people living with dementia. And education, as we've already talked about, understanding, empathy, compassion, kindness, these underpin what a dementia-friendly society is and needs to be, but they also underpin what a better province is for all of us. And I have said this in our gatherings before, a dementia-friendly society is a friendly society. It benefits all of us. And um, much like my colleague, Emily Bond, uh, of course, we all know people who are affected with dementia, whether they're in our immediate family or our larger family or friends group. And we don't stop loving uh, the people we know who have dementia. We don't forget uh, who they are and what makes them so beloved to us. Uh, and I think that the steps that uh, we've heard about today for taking, ensuring that people can stay supported, be active, be participants in their communities, remain connect, connected to friends and family, the wider community, this makes all of our communities stronger and healthier. And uh, Craig has so effectively demonstrated this with his story today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to ask um, perhaps uh, Jim Mann, um, who's been living with dementia. Um, would you, uh, could you ask your question to the panel? Sure. Thank you, Robert. Hi, my name is Jim Mann. And I've been living with dementia since 2007. And my question for you is, how would you encourage the participation of people with lived experience of dementia and caregiving to be involved in the development of policies that affect them. Thank you, Jim. Uh, perhaps we can hear from Emily Bond first. Uh, thank you very much. And, and first of all, Jim, it is always fantastic to see you. Uh, I probably have known Jim since he, he was uh, close to the very beginning of his, uh, his diagnosis. And I think that Jim actually exemplifies uh, and the stories that Craig shared today, exactly what needs to continue to happen. Uh, I remember very specifically that Jim actually made a trip to Prince George, uh, which is where I live and where I am today. And he reached out to our community uh, through a public uh, opportunity 
Um, he talked to mayors, to councillors, to MLAs, to anyone who would listen about the importance of the kind of community that we can create. So Jim, I want to express, I want to express my personal gratitude for the impact that you had on me as, a, as, a, as an MLA, um, as I think about what we need to do in the legislature and, and certainly from a policy perspective. So it is listen, we've heard so much about that today. Um, you know, uh, families, caregivers, uh, people impacted with dementia need to tell the story. And our job is to listen and to respond. So again, you know, approach the, your, your mayor or your counselors or your MLA, have that conversation, and then together design an action plan, talk about the specific steps that you can take in your community. But it takes leaders like the leadership team uh, presentations we saw today. And I certainly want to, uh, to say thank you to people like Jim Mann, who has certainly influenced my thinking as a policymaker, we need to do more of this and we need to make sure we do it across the aisles in the legislature. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. Um, perhaps over to MLA first to know next. No, oh, thank you so much. And thank you for the question, Jim. I think it is, it is really important. And today is an example of this, that these uh, opportunities are created for the input uh, and the informed information that we're getting from people living with dementia and caregivers. I think it's, it shouldn't be the onus uh, on those people. It should be the onus on us, on the systems to create that space, to invite those conversations, to ensure that we're taking in uh, the lived experience and understanding. And, and I know that in our constituency offices, for example, we hear a lot from seniors and from caregivers and people living with dementia about some of the uh, systemic challenges that they're facing. And one of the most worrying, for example, that we've been hearing in the last uh, several months is around renovations uh, and people being evicted from their homes, uh, people being, um, you know, driven or coerced or whatever it is to sign things, not understanding what they're signing and finding themselves in these very precarious situations. And so I think there is, uh, the, the, as us, the, what comes into our offices can also very much inform uh, the work that we do in this building and on policy making. But I think it really is important that the space is made for these conversations, that the, the invitation is extended and that the onus really is on on the system to, to ensure that that input is happening. Thank you, Emily, first to know. Um, over to Parliamentary Secretary, Secretary Elmore. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for your uh, question, Jim, and, and for your leadership. I agree with my colleagues, uh, Emily Shirley Bond and, and Emily Sonia first to know and the importance of having uh, folks with the Alzheimer's and caregivers uh, really at the center and involved in the decision making process. And I think that yourself, uh, the Alzheimer's Society, your leadership circle really exemplifies that. And, you know, to get the message out to encourage uh, all individuals and families to also play that role um, themselves at the center. And uh, uh, there are resources available certainly through uh, the Alzheimer's Society and uh, online through uh, Patients as Partners uh, program, which does exactly that and will help and lead uh, anyone who, you know, encourage, empower individuals to take that step and um, take uh, to be empowered uh, in their own care with the theme. Um, you know, I think it's very telling the quote, nothing about me without me. Uh, I know that that's uh, that's uh, that's a familiar refrain um, to ensure that um, patient families uh, and caregivers uh, that their voice is incorporated at all levels of the healthcare system, um, and so that's uh, I think um, you know a very effective program, and there are resources in place, and I think led by yourself, Jim, the leadership um, circle, and also the Alzheimer's Society to encourage uh, all British Columbians to access those resources and to really um, you know, take that step uh, and to, to have their, their voice at the center and be involved uh, actively in those processes. So it's a way I think that we're gonna transform uh, the understanding um, and really dismantle the, the stigma around uh, dementia 
sharing these stories um, and also raising awareness amongst uh, British Columbians. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Parliamentary Thank you. Secretary. Um, now through the wonders of technology, I think uh, Naomi was lost, but we have now found her. So um, perhaps uh, I'd like to invite Na uh, caregiver Naomi Meissen to ask uh, her question. Thank you very much for the opportunity and sorry for temporarily dropping off, but you have to love uh, the joys of technology. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Naomi Meissen and I am a caregiver for my mother who uh, was diagnosed with early onset dementia and is currently living in long-term care. I have been her caregiver for over 13 years, so um, have plenty of experience and uh, seen the evolution of um, the disease. So my question for the ministers are, uh, what have you learned about the impact of the pandemic on your constituents who are living with dementia and their caregivers and what supports are they seeking? Thank you very much, Naomi. Perhaps we can hear from Emily Firstenode to begin. Thank you, uh, Naomi, for the question. And, and I think that uh, the common thread that we've heard from constituents and the community is that those who are supporting people with dementia is that the system is overworked, that people are burning out, that it is uh, very challenging in a system that already has enormous pressures. And then we've added COVID on top of that. And COVID has, of course, as we've seen, and just today, the uh, update from the minister and Dr. Henry, um, those pressures remain and they are very significant. Um, one constituent said to us very clearly, COVID didn't break the system, COVID exposed the system. And I think that that's been a common thread as well. I recently have had the experience of my mother in her 80s uh, suffer a really serious fall and injury and live very firsthand uh, with the, the coming to terms with how stretched the system is, how stretched um, people are within the system. And I think that it's really important that we learn this now and that we are taking concrete steps to release and uh, decrease these pressures so that uh, caregivers, uh, support workers, people living with dementia, people living uh, with injuries and, and serious complications are not having the situation exacerbated because they can't get the support that they need. And uh, again, this really comes down to um, how do we be the best society we can be? And it is about caring for the people who need it the most. Thank you for that thoughtful answer, Emily Personal. Um, over to Parliamentary Secretary Elmore. Uh, thank you, Naomi, for, for your question. And yes, I have heard uh, from friends uh, and also constituents uh, who are caregivers looking after family members with dementia or Alzheimer's. And I think one of the clearest, um, you, you know, a very clear theme that, that has made an impression on me is the need for um, respite services, the need to support caregivers and to support family. And um, to provide a break uh, for them as well. So uh, that's really important and critical. And I'm pleased that that our government has expanded that as well, um, you know, important to provide these services of adult day programs. And that has been impacted. You, you mentioned Naomi in terms of COVID. So certainly looking at um, reestablishing that and ensuring that uh, those community supports are in place. So I think that um, there's a real need to not only provide uh, excellent care uh, for folks who are suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, but also recognizing caregivers and family members need that support and as they are often uh, play such a key role in, in terms of supporting their loved ones. So we take we need to take a holistic approach um, and you know, certainly it's, it's, it's just put an incredible uh, stress and strain um, on, on everyone during these times, but um, we're, you know, our government and the, and the legislature is committed to ensuring that, um, you know, that these supports are in place and the critical role of respite uh, in adult day programs and, um, and support services are so critical. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary. Um, lastly, I'd like to ask MLA Bond for her thoughts. 
Well, thank you very much for the question, Naomi, and thank you uh, for sharing your own personal story. Um, I wish for you a, a very special Christmas present, and that is the, the chance to, to spend that time with your mom. Uh, I think certainly I know that uh, Sonia and I, for example, spent a, a good part of, of the pandemic working uh, and talking about uh, through a committee that Mr. Dix uh, put together about seniors, uh, those that were in care and those that were in community. And one of the most devastating things for families, yours and mine and many others, was the inability to be with people uh, that rely on us, uh, that miss us, that love us, that we cherish. I think that that time apart uh, had a very significant impact on, on uh, both the, the person in care and, and the, the, the caregiver. Uh, I think we, we went through some challenging times and obviously those restrictions and that time apart uh, was necessary, but I think we need to look at what that looks like in the future. We know there was inconsistency across the province at times and I had those conversations directly with Minister Dix and we worked to try to solve those problems. So I, I, we, we certainly did hear uh, and continue to hear about uh, the, the impacts of that separation, that physical separation uh, for families, uh, for caregivers and those impacted uh, with dementia but also uh, people in community who were missing their, their programs. Uh, and as Mabel said, you know, respite, very, very important for us to make sure that families have that kind of option. So it was the whole issue of separation and what that did. It created more anxiety, a sense of, of, uh, of uh, distress for many people who already feel isolated in many of our communities. And I just want to recognize something that uh, I think um, it was Neil that talked about the need for us in the post pandemic world to talk about long term care. Um, that is one of the legacies of the pandemic, we need to talk about how we enhance the system of care for people uh, in long term care. Uh, so I think there's lots of work for us to do, not necessarily specifically dementia related, but it's all tied together. So um, uh, I know that that was, must have been very difficult days for you, Naomi, and everyone else who, uh, who had to be separated. And I'm sure you've seen the impacts of that. That's what I've heard. And we have a lot of work to do to ensure that if we're ever faced with these circumstances again, that we've learned lessons, that we've listened, and uh, that, we, uh, that we're there now to respond to those people who, who face the impacts of that long separation. Thank you, Emily Bond. Um, and thank you to all three of our speakers for their answers um, and to the leadership group members for asking these questions. We really do appreciate you guys all taking the time and effort to, to help us as we, we, we think more and more about what um, dementia means in our society and creating a dementia friendly society. I would now like to invite uh, Minister Dix and Jen Lyle, our CEO, to share their thoughts after this discussion. I encourage all of you to share your own thoughts in the chat box um, and we can go from there. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Minister Dix and Jen. Hey, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you to everyone uh, who's asked really excellent questions and to my colleagues. Uh, uh, Shirley Vaughn's and First Nomi of Elmore for their excellent answers. I, I think uh, I'll just say a couple of things, just a couple of reflections. I think one of the things that we have done exceptionally well as a healthcare system, as a society, is extend life. We support each other, we provide, I think, some of the best healthcare in the world. Certainly, our outcomes when people get sick, even with COVID 19 and then standing. And we've been making significant investments and a huge proportion of what we invest in what we do is the safety of people and their basic health. But we also have to live well. And uh, as a community, one of the things I cared most about, it came out of discussions I had with uh, some people living with dementia, with seniors, with seniors advocate and others, was what Mabel talked about, which is investing in, in, uh, in true, which is talking about investment in respite and adult day programs. It was one of the things uh, if you asked me in 2019, I was proudest of since the Minister of Health of that investment and the energy given to that. And we have to acknowledge that those significant investments this past year have gone away because people haven't been able to come together. 
And what we can't do, I think, at the end of the pandemic, I think it's very important to prepare for the future to, as we deal through this pandemic, which is obviously still very much with us, um, is, is to be better in the future. And take what has been lost by people living with dementia, but also people living in long-term care in general, and giving them more agency and more liberty and more freedom within the limits, of course, of their health, but still more freedom. And so one of the things that we're going to look at together, we're going to be uh, asking um, uh, Ron and my first class critics to make this more possible. is to look at, at proposals for improvement on the institutional way of managing resources in long term care. About making I got I got put on mute at some point there, so I just uh, maybe I'll just repeat the questions. Uh, I'm not, not sure how that happened. It was magical, but um, but uh, just to say, it's something that I think all the parties here are committed to working on, which is to increase the institutional role of families and people living in long-term care over their circumstances. And we can do this institutionally, so it's part of the regular daily effort that we make together. I think it helps improve the quality of care. Of course, the enormous investments and all of the benefit budgets and support, all those are important. But we also have to make sure after this pandemic that seniors who are living in long-term care, that others who are living in long-term care who are not seniors, people who are living in dementia long-term care who are often not seniors, in fact, have within, of course, their big limits that we have to have their exercise, even in those circumstances, our freedom that we have to. We have to engage in things that allow everyone to do that. And so uh, with that couple of reflections, I'll hand it over to, uh, to Jen Lyle to say a few words and I think to take us home and introduce it as well. Jen? Thank you very much, Minister Dix, for uh, sharing your reflections and your observations. And um, my thanks again to the members of our leadership groups for sharing your stories, your thoughts, and of course, to our panelists today for participating in this and this really important discussion, it's, I, I can't emphasize enough how meaningful it is to the Alzheimer's Society BC to have all of you join us here today, uh, including those who are participating on the call and, and to have you to have talk about your experiences and what you're hearing from your constituents, the people in your lives, and how the voices of people with lived experience need to inform the policies that impact them. And I think we heard that really clearly in the discussions today and um, also too in Minister Dix, your comments just a, a few seconds ago. So I also wanted to share a couple other reflections that I had uh, as we were going through the discussions and, and sharing our stories today. And one of them was just the theme of challenges, but also resilience in the face of challenge. And one of the things I was reflecting on um, with Craig's remarks was, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to persevere despite it. And that was one of the things that really came home for me is just the immense courage and resiliency and tenacity people who are affected by dementia have exhibited over this past uh, year and a half and just in general. The other thing that I was reflecting on too is as much as we associate Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia with negative connotations, with things like loss and grief and, and fear um, and stigma, there are also things like purpose, finding purpose while living with a disease, or if you are you know, supporting someone who is living with disease, having vibrancy in your life, having connection, having joy, dare I say, having joy and enjoyment in what you do. So I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that you can live well with dementia. And I think the key thing that I heard from our panelists and the people who shared their story today was the caveat of, with the right supports. And that was one of the things that I, I was reflecting on as well. And I, I don't think it's coincidental that the National Dementia Strategy is called Together We Aspire, because that's a key word right there, together. You know, as much as dementia is a disease that affects the family, affects the entire community, it takes a community response to overcome it. And that's the thing that I find so incredibly exciting about this. And the, you know, looking at it from a larger perspective, the intersectionality of our work, the fact that 
a dementia friendly province is a province that is overall more inclusive, more vibrant, more welcoming. And so I just really want to thank everyone for sharing your thoughts and reflections today and um, just wanted to reflect back some of the takeaways I took from today's discussions. Um, and so without further ado, I think I'd like to pass the virtual mic over to our incoming board chair, Amy McCallion, to give closing remarks. And in a few short days, Amy will be picking up the torch from Robert and uh, taking over the role of society board chair. Minister Dix, your comments. Um, I, you know, I know Amy well. I'm sure she will do a phenomenal job. I don't think she was thrown by your comments in celebration of the wonderful work that Robert has done for the society. So thank you for that. So uh, without, over, without further ado, over to you, Amy. Thanks, Jen. I'm so excited to be taking over from Robert and I really appreciate the conversation that we're having today. I also wanna say thank you to Minister Dix and to our speakers today. Thank you to Craig and the members of the leadership groups for the people living with dementia and caregivers for sharing their experiences with us. Thank you as well to Parliamentary Secretary Elmore, MLA Bond and MLA First and Now for sharing your observations and experiences with us. Thank you to everyone for joining us today to learn more about the impacts of dementia. And thank you for your support, your continued interest in the society and the work that we are so passionate about. Thank you for partnering with us to provide the support and education that people need where and when they need it. We hope that today inspired you to consider the ways that you can support the society, learn from our experiences so far during the pandemic and help people affected by dementia stay actively engaged as members of our community. Have a great rest of your day.